little sock lives in a drawer. Um... Wah! Oof. Little sock gets worn. Whoa. Little sock gets dirty. Ugh. <laughs> Little sock gets washed. Ah. <sighs> For little sock, every day is the same. <laughs> All the other socks seem happy. But little sock dreams of something different. He has heard of a magical place called Sock City, where every day is a new adventure. The only way to get to Sock City is through a secret tunnel in the back of the dryer. Late one night, Little Sock sneaks out of the drawer and climbs into the tunnel. The tunnel is very dark and very scary. But Little Sock is brave. He sees a light at the end of the tunnel. Oh! There it is! Sock City! Everywhere Little Sock looks, he sees something new and exciting. There are big socks. No. Tiny socks. Oh. <laughs> New socks. Oh, hello. Old socks. Oh, hello. Sporty socks. <laughs> Straight socks. <laughs> Polka dot socks. <laughs> and even smelly socks. Oh, yeah! So many different socks doing different things. Every day is a new adventure. <sighs> Little Sock had the best time in Sock City. Hmm. He can't wait to go back again. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> bring a friend. <laughs> oh, let's go! His grit. Let me tell you a story about Ronnie Lott. When others gave up, Ronnie did not. Ronnie always did what he set his mind to, dedicated and tough through and through. As a boy, he bought shoes that were red as fire. The commercial said they'd make him fly higher. So with all of his effort and all of his might, Ronnie prepared for his very first flight. 
But all his excitement and thrill didn't last. He jumped through the air, but came crashing down fast. It was after his unfortunate plunk of a tumble that Ronnie felt something inside start to rumble. He sat there a bit, somewhat battered and bruised, and brooded across from his new pair of shoes. Maybe these shoes won't make me jump high. Maybe it's me and how hard I try. That rumble in Ronnie is what we call grit. A voice that encouraged him, don't ever quit. Grit followed Ronnie as he grew and grew. Every time that he played or tried something new, he was skilled at sports, and that helped him thrive. But grit always urged him, continue to strive. Grit had a voice that was strong and impactful, but Ronnie still needed to learn to be tactful. Like when his coach said, throw as hard as you can, and he knocked someone over. That wasn't the plan. Respect those around you, his dad would say. Ronnie listened and learned along the way. In high school, Ronnie joined the football team and suddenly knew that he had a dream. When he put on his helmet and all of his gear, he felt that same rumble. His purpose was clear. While he missed some tackles and dropped some balls, he never gave up or stopped giving his all. When he fell, Grit told him, get back up again. When he lost, Grit said, I know we can win. His mistakes were chances to try a new way. And tomorrow was always a brilliant new day. Years passed and he joined a professional team. Ronnie and his grit were achieving their dreams. Sometimes he got hurt, and sometimes his team lost. He kept doing his best, no matter the cost. One fateful day on the football field, he was put to the test, and his grit didn't yield. Ronnie got hurt. It was really a zinger. He arose from the play, losing part of his finger. But even that didn't stop him from reaching his dream and inspiring others, including his team. Today, Ronnie's football days are past but his grit stays strong and always will last. He continues to give everything his all, whether teaching kids or playing ball. Every time he helps inspire someone, every time he cheers on his daughters or sons, grit is helping him follow through. Give this life all you've got. I believe in you. Have you listened closely to that voice deep inside? 
The one that's telling you never to hide? Next time you're down or feeling blue, remember that grit lives within you too. It's the whisper that says, yes, you can. Yes, you can. It's the belief in yourself. It's your greatest fan. It's never too late to call up your grit. Your own tiny voice that rumbles. Don't quit. Plant a Kiss, written by Amy Kraus Rosenthal, illustrated by Peter H. Reynolds. It goes like this. Little Miss. Planted a kiss. Planted a kiss? Planted a kiss. Sunshine. Water. Greet. Repeat. Wait and <sighs> wait. Getting late. Doubt. Pout. Sprout. <laughs> Shout! Shout! about Wow How What now Stare and stare I'll share she declared Don't you dare it's far too rare. I it'll go bare. She didn't care. From there, everywhere. To and fro. High and low. Rain or snow. With a bow. Alas, time to go. So she returned. There she learned. From one little kiss. <gasps> Endless bliss.
bliss. Where are you? By Jonathan Sunday. Where are you? Lounging in my nook, reading a good book. Where are you? Sitting on a cinder block, knitting me a winter sock. Where are you? Having a yummy plump plum with my lumpy stump chum. <laughs> Where are you? Riding George the gorgeous porpoise past enormous surging orcas. Where are you? Getting ready to slurp spaghetti with Freddy Gazzetti, the sweaty yeti. <laughs> Where are you? Riding on the back of a giraffe gone quackers while snacking on a pack of alpaca shaped crackers. Where are you? Surfing on a blue spruce with old Rusty McDoose, but my trusty goose noose feels a wee bit loose. <laughs> oh. A wee bit loof? Where are you, goof? Is? I'm here in this box, safe from hard knocks. Do you want to come play? Not right now. I'm afraid. We could snack on the way. I think I'll just stay. If the here where you are isn't the where that you want, don't sit where you are feeling glum on your bum. Get up and start working to change where you're from. Cause bruises and gooses and fears and excuses can't stop you from living the life that you choose, is. Is? Where are you? Oh, sorry for skipping the end of your speech. Had to rescue an Eskimo lost on the beach. Then I wrote a hit song about butternut squashes. Now I'm testing some specs on my rocket galoshes. Woohoo! Thanks for the boost. The end. Little girl, big dream. The story of Olympian Samantha Peshik. Little Samantha Peshik loved gymnastics. More than toys, even more than ice cream. And that's saying something. When she was just five years old, she watched the Olympics for the first time with her mom and dad. Of course, her favorite part was the gymnastics competition. 
She loved the way the athletes moved on the floor, the vault, the uneven bars, and the balance beam. It was right then and there that Samantha had a dream. A big dream! I'm going to be an Olympian, she shouted. Her mom and dad said, Dream big, Samantha. You can accomplish anything you set your mind to. Samantha thought, to be an Olympian, I must be the very best gymnast out there. So Samantha practiced and dreamed and practiced and dreamed and practiced and dreamed some more. She even had her mom help her hang the word dream up in her room so she would never forget her big plan to be the very best. In her room, she would close her eyes and pretend to compete in front of the world, just like the Olympians on TV. She told everyone she met about this dream. I'm going to be an Olympic gymnast someday. She told her teacher, her neighbor, kids at the park, her coaches, <laughs> the grocer. And that means I have to be the best. She'd let them all know. The more Samantha practiced, the better she got. She soon found she was great at all of the events, except for one, the balance beam. She would climb onto the beam, put her arms in the air, take a deep breath, bend her knees to jump, and then... Nothing. For some reason, she was too afraid to do it. This made Samantha very upset. <laughs> I couldn't do it, Mom. I have to be the best. <laughs> or else I won't be able to go to the Olympics. <laughs> Samantha's mom looked at her and said, You have to have the bad days to appreciate the good days. Dream big, Samantha. You can accomplish anything you set your mind to. She remembered that when she went to bed at night, staring at the word dream on her wall. I can accomplish anything. I won't give up, no matter what. That meant it was time to keep trying at that scary balance beam. And with the help of her new coach, Peter, she finally overcame her fears. With Peter's coaching and her parents' love, Samantha felt unbeatable. Next stop, nationals! Or so she thought. When it was time to compete for her big chance, Samantha made a couple mistakes. She didn't make the team and became an alternate. Samantha was very upset again. Two little mistakes made her feel like one big failure. I'm so mad I didn't win. She mumbled on her drive home that day. Her parents looked at her and said, We don't love you because you win. We love you because we love you. Dream big, Samantha. You can accomplish anything you set your mind to. Samantha kept practicing and dreaming and practicing and dreaming and practicing some more. Finally, the day came. The day she had dreamed about since she was five years old. She made the Olympic team. 
She was all set to compete and be the very best when something terrible happened. Ah. While practicing right before the competition, Samantha hurt her ankle. Oh no. Samantha was very upset. And then she remembered her mom and dad's words. I have to have the bad days to appreciate the good days. I'm not loved because I win. I'm loved because I'm me. Maybe being the very best doesn't always mean winning the gold medal after all, Samantha thought. Maybe being the very best me today means supporting my team. Samantha cheered on her teammates during their floor routines. You can do it! She cheered them on during all of their routines. Yeah! Dream big, she told them. Yeah! You can accomplish anything you set your mind to, she said. Woo! And they did. Woohoo! Even with her hurt ankle, she was able to compete in the uneven bars. And it was her best routine ever. She stood on the Olympic podium and was awarded a silver medal. She watched as everyone cheered for her and for her team. Today, Samantha coaches kids just like you and reminds them to keep dreaming keep practicing, and keep supporting each other. Do you have a dream like Samantha? The Boy Who Grew a Forest. The True Story of Jadav Paying. The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time to plant a tree is now. Proverb. In India, on a large river island, among farms and families, hard at work, there lived a boy who loved trees. Trees meant shade, food, and shelter for many. But each rainy season, Floodwaters swallowed more and more of the beautiful tree-covered land. The boy's precious island was shrinking, eroding away with the rushing river, leaving empty sandbars behind. The boy witnessed animals stranded on those sandbars, their homes destroyed. He feared that if animals withered without trees, people would too. The boy shared his fears with the village. The elders explained that the only way to help animals was to create new homes for them. They gifted the boy with 20 bamboo saplings. Alone, he canoed down the muddy river. He wished he could cover all the land with trees.
but a large sandbar nearby was a place to start. The land was too barren for animals, the shores too sandy for leafy trees. Would bamboo grow? The boy hoped. Determined, he began to plant. One shaft, two, then three. Every day, he watered the saplings by hand, sweat trickling down his face and chest. He built a watering system to help and lugged heavy buckets from the river. His arms grew tired, his back sore. Still, each day he tended to the plants and, over time, the bamboo patch grew into a healthy thicket. The boy was proud of his work, but he worried it wouldn't be enough to stop the swelling river or to provide shelter for animals. If he wanted more plants to grow, he would have to create a richer soil. The boy carried cow dung, earthworms, termites, and angry red ants that bit him on the journey to the new home. He brought seeds from neighboring villages, over trails, through brush, down the river. Each day, he planted. As years passed and the boy grew, so did a forest. 10 acres, 20 acres, then 40. Wildlife returned for the first time in many years. Buffalo, one-horned rhinos and snakes, gibbons, migratory birds and elephants. The man's forest teemed with life and diversity. Not everyone was happy. Fear swept over the villages when tigers arrived. So the man planted more grasses to attract small animals that would keep the tigers happy in the forest. Elephants wandered into neighboring farms to feast on the crops. So the man planted more fruiting trees to help feed the hungry elephants. Some wanted to harvest the forest to build homes. But the man was there to plant anew. Others tried to hunt the animals for their horns and fur. But the man was there to protect. Few thought the forest would last, but the man believed in its strength. Now in India, on a large river island, among wildlife and trees as tall as buildings. There lives a man who has planted a forest. The forest is called Molai, after a man named 
Jadav Molai Paying, who never stopped planting and pruning and protecting. Only by growing plants, the earth will survive. Jadav Paying. Let's Explore Space by Ali Stahl. We can find adventure all over the place, so let's get together and go explore space. Everett wants to go to the moon to jump around and float until noon. Lucy hopes to visit Mars and see the Earth from afar. Elijah is dreaming of the chance to see a Martian do a space dance. Maisie and her net are prepared to catch a comet flying through the air. Now a rocket ship is what we need to travel through space at a great speed. Everett needs to go to the moon, so in his rocket ship he zooms. Lucy wishes to go and see Mars, so in her ship she blasts through the stars. Elijah can't wait to see Martians dance, so he races off through the great expanse. A comet is what Maisie wants to see, so her ship takes off. Ready? One, two, three! On our way through the stars we soar, now we have landed and it's time to explore. Everett longed to see the moon and in his rocket ship he zoomed. Now he can float around all day for he has landed. Hip hip hooray! Lucy wanted to visit Mars so off she blasted through the stars. Now she can see her earthly home. It looks so small from where she roams. Elijah wanted to see Martians dance, so he raced through the great expanse. He found new friends, some small and some big. They taught him how to do a space jig. A comet is what Maisie dreamed to see, so she took off at a great speed. Now in her brand new net she found a comet so big and shiny and round. We had a great adventure here, way outside the atmosphere. It's fun to explore. There's so much to see. I wonder what tomorrow's adventure will be. People who changed the world. William Wilberforce. It is inconceivable that we could be bored in a world with so much wrong to tackle. Little William saw people from Africa being taken as slaves. He knew he had to do something. William told everyone who would listen how bad the slave ships were. In 1807, the leaders of Great Britain finally agreed that the slave trade should end. Harriet Tubman. You have within you the strength, the patience, and the passion to change the world. 
Little Harriet did not like being told what to do. But because she had dark skin, that's exactly what happened all day long. In 1849, Harriet ran north to freedom. She helped others escape too. People called her secret path the Underground Railroad. Abraham Lincoln. Be sure you put your feet in the right place. Then stand firm. Little Abe saw many people working as slaves in America. No one could agree whether that was good or bad. Abe became president. In 1863, he signed a paper that said all the slaves would be free. Many people were angry. But Abe knew it was the right thing to do. Susan B. Anthony. Failure is impossible. Little Susan wanted to vote for her leaders like the boys could, but that was illegal for girls. Susan tried to vote once, but she got arrested. Susan spent her whole life telling people that everyone should be treated equally. Finally, word spread that things had to change. In 1920, women in America gained the right to vote. Mahatma Gandhi. You must be the change you wish to see in the world. Little Gandhi liked working things out peacefully. When Great Britain tried to make his people pay for salt, Gandhi didn't fight. Instead, in 1930, he walked 241 miles to the coast to get his own salt. Gandhi's peaceful march helped thousands of people realize that India should be its own country and that you don't have to fight to make a difference. Rosa Parks. I believe we are here on the planet Earth to live, grow up, and do what we can to make this world a better place. Little Rosa noticed that the children with white skin got to ride the bus to school. Children with dark skin had to walk to an older building. In 1955, a city bus driver told Rosa to give her seat to a man with light skin. Nope, Rosa said. She went to jail. Many people stopped riding the bus. After 381 days, the leaders decided to change the rules. Martin Luther King Jr. The time is always right to do what is right. Little Martin went shoe shopping with his dad. The owner said, we only serve people with dark skin in the back. 
They left the store instead. One day, Martin gave a speech about how we should treat each other. I have a dream, he said. He wanted everyone to be judged by their hearts, not by the color of their skin. In 1964, American leaders finally agreed that Martin was right. Malala Yousafzai. One child, one teacher, one book, one pen can change the world. Little Malala loved to learn. But in Pakistan where she lived, some people said girls shouldn't go to school. Some people tried to stop her. Brave Malala didn't back down. She insisted that every child should go to school. In 2014, when she was 17, Malala became the youngest person to receive the Nobel Peace Prize. These heroes stood up to make a difference in the world. What kind of hero will you be? Allegro. A magical journey through 11 musical masterpieces. One rainy afternoon, Allegro sat at the old family piano. He was plink, trying to plunk, practice his latest bonk piece. But, slam! <sighs> it just wasn't going well. I hate this music, Allegro said. He crumpled it up into a tiny ball and threw it on the floor. There it lay, like a pale dot against the dark wood. But dots are funny things, because if they grow lines, and more lines, and march in lines, they become something that just might transport you to magical places. Away Allegro went, carried off on the sounds of enchanting melodies. He danced with the sailors of wind-tossed ships. <sighs> he walked in the fragrant meadows of morning's first light. He explored the shores of uncharted lands. Some 
melodies were sad and made his heart ache. Some were triumphant and made his heart swell. At times, he wanted to dance a jig. He wanted to march and sing. And at the best of times, he wanted to stand up and shout with joy. I am Allegro! Slowly, slowly, like the dimming light of the setting moon, the music faded. And Allegro was back home. It was still time to practice. So he did. And he did. And he did. Fantastic future. Hmm. Oh. Hey, Mizar. What would you like to be when you grow up? Hmm. What tantalizing things await me? What about doing what astronauts do? And fly to a new planet? Whoa! Houston, this is Nazari. Do you copy? Or I can be a farmer and make sure the food the world eats is organic. Huh. Uh. Yep, good crop season this year. Daddy, Daddy! What about being a construction worker and building homes for all? Going up? Whee! Or I can be an engineer and make a bridge to the moon that won't fall. Hmm. <gasps> I've got it! I'm coming for you, moon. Daddy, what about being a doctor? So I can treat people that have been twisted and twirled. Deep breath. You're gonna be just fine. Or I can be a scientist and freely light up the world. Let's see here. <gasps> Eureka! I've done it again. Daddy! What about traveling the world? 
and seeing each culture's beauty. Mmm, this looks delicious! <laughs> Hi, I'm Nazari. Or I can clean teeth as a dentist with toothpaste that is fruity. Open wide! Have you been flossing? Good job! Hmm... Wait, Daddy! Can I do all of them? <laughs> Dream you'll be. Go to bed, each sleepy child, and dream what dreams you might. Dreaming's good most any time, but especially at night. Dream you'll be a movie star with your name lit up in lights. Or that you'll be a superhero flying around in tights. Would you like to be a doctor saving people's lives? Or perhaps a beekeeper Pending buzzing hives. What if you're a musketeer fighting battles with your sword? Or a world class surfer catching waves upon your board? <laughs> Maybe you're an architect designing a brand new city. Or are you a writer telling stories warm and witty? <laughs> you could be a brave firefighter running through a fire. Or a fearless acrobat high upon a wire. Whoa. Perchance you'll be a dancer leaping across the floor. <laughs> or maybe a soccer star with the winning score. How about a veterinarian curing a giant snake? Yeah. Or a skillful baker baking a giant cake. Mm. See yourself as a teacher, helping children think. Or a figure skater, gliding around a rink. You'd make a fine police officer, saving people in distress. Or a bold explorer, finding the monster of Loch Ness. Imagine you're an astronaut bouncing on the moon. Or maybe you're a famous rocker belting out a tune. Yeah! Dream that you're a pirate sailing oceans blue. Or a brilliant scientist finding something new. Whoa. Do you wish you were a pilot soaring to great heights? Or a clever artist painting the world's great sights? Maybe 
you're a mountaineer climbing to the summit. Or a fearless skydiver whose job it is to plummet. You could be a football player winning games with teammates. Or maybe you're the president of these United States. This world is full of many things to dream that you can be. Just remember, you're already the most precious thing to me. Now, close your eyes, each sleepy child, and dream what dreams you may. I'll see you in the morning when you start a brand new day. Once there was a boy who had no toys to play with. The other children in the neighborhood had lots of toys. Every afternoon, the boy would go to the park, sit under a big tree, and watch the other children play. Sometimes they let the boy play with their toys, sometimes not. This made the boy sad. One day, as the boy was sitting under the big tree in the park, he noticed a stick leaning against the trunk. He had never seen such an unusual stick. He picked it up. Suddenly, he was a pirate. Arg! Then a baseball player at bat. And then a knight on a steed. that there were words carved into the stick. He sang them like a song. Imagination lives in you. It's the fire in all you do. Use it well, and you can be anything you want to be. The boy carried the stick everywhere, and anywhere he was, he was anything he wanted to be. At the beach, he was a fisherman. At the lake, he paddled a canoe. He was a hiker in the highlands, and his imagination grew. Time passed, and the boy grew up. With the stick's inspiration, he became everything he wanted to be. He took business trips and airplane rides. He sailed the seas on rising tides. He gave of his time, he gave of his wealth, he gave from his heart. He gave of himself. He built a house high on a hill, overlooking the valley where he had grown up. In the distance, he could see the park and the old tree where he used to sit. As the years passed, the boy became an old man. But each day, 
he took his stick with him to the park and sat on a bench near the tree where he had found the stick so long ago. He would sit for hours and watch the children play. All of the children seemed to have lots of toys to play with, except for one little girl. The little girl always sat under the old tree and watched the other children play with their toys. This made the old man sad. Early one morning, the old man walked to the park, but instead of sitting on the bench, he went over to the tree. He leaned the stick against its trunk, walked to his bench, and waited. Soon, the children arrived at the park with their toys. He waited to see if the little girl would show. He saw her walk slowly toward the tree. She peered down at the unusual stick leaning against its trunk. She picked up the stick, and suddenly, she was a princess. A fencer. Then, a surfer riding a wave. She noticed that there were words carved into the stick, and as she danced away, she sang them like a song. Imagination lives in you. It's the fire in all you do. Use it well, and you can be anything you want to be. And the old man smiled and walked home. diverged in a yellow wood. And sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler. Just as fair. And having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though, as for that, the passing there had worn them really about the same. first for another day. Mm. 
Yet knowing how way <sighs> leads on to way. I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh. Somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood. And I, I took the one less traveled by. That has made all the difference. A caterpillar grows into a butterfly, but nobody knew exactly how that change, which is called metamorphosis, happened. Until Maria Sibela Mario. She loved insects so much that she spent years watching and drawing them. She traveled across the ocean to study the life cycles of caterpillars and other bugs. Maria's drawings were very detailed and beautiful and they gave scientists important information about insects and plants. Ah, oh, hello. <laughs> Her drawings were used in the Linnaean system that organizes all living things. This system is important in all of biology. Well, if we compared you and a rock, we'd find a lot of differences. Hmm. But the biggest one is that you're alive huh? and a rock isn't. Oh. Biology looks at everything that is alive, like plants, animals, and you. People have been studying life for a long time. Almost a thousand years ago, Hildegard of Bingen wrote about biology and medicine. Back then, people didn't understand that they could get sick from drinking dirty water. Hildegard figured out that water should be cleaned first, and this stopped people from getting sick. She also studied how plants could be used as medicines 
and shared her ideas so people could have better health. Hmm. <gasps> oh. So, biology keeps me from getting sick? It can, because biology teaches us all about how the body works. When we know what makes us sick, then we can find ways to get better. Just look at Jane Cook Wright. She was a doctor who saved many lives by running experiments in her laboratory. She grew cells in petri dishes and then watched what different medicines did to the cells. Her observations helped her pick the best treatments to give her patients. <laughs> what are cells? All living things are made of cells. Your body is made up of trillions. Each cell has its own special job. Muscle cells help you move, and skin cells protect your body. The cells inside your nose help you smell. Linda Buck won a Nobel Prize because she helped discover that nose cells have tiny message receivers called receptors. When different smells hit the receptors, the cells send messages to your brain. That's why, even if you closed your eyes, you could smell the difference between a flower and a dog. Wow, but how does a cell know its special job? Inside of every cell is an instruction manual called DNA. It's the blueprint or plan for your whole body. DNA tells the body how to make cells and build body parts like muscles, bones, and skin. It also determines the color of your eyes and hair and is what makes you, you. But DNA is not just in people's cells. It's also found in all living things. Barbara McClintock studied DNA in corn and discovered something completely amazing. By observing the colors in corn kernels, she learned that parts of DNA, genes, can actually switch places. She named these jumping genes transposons. Transposons were such a surprise that it was many years before people realized she was right and awarded her a Nobel Prize. Barbara loved figuring out tricky problems. When she made a hypothesis or scientific guess, she worked hard on her research and experiments to find answers. And it's a good thing, because her work with DNA and transposons taught us so much about our genes and DNA. You can start researching right now. <gasps> Pick something that you like and ask a question. <gasps> okay, why do butterflies have different colors? Go on and take your own guess. That's your hypothesis.
then observe by looking closer, 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 and see if you're right. You may be surprised by the results. Cinderella by Leslie Harder, illustrated by Natasha Herzl. Cinderella was a sad servant girl who had absolutely nothing to wear. Well, not nothing. She did have a handkerchief that she wore on her head, but it was hideous and full of huge holes. She did have a dress that she wore every day, but it was dingy and dusty and worst of all, dull. She did have two socks that went under her shoes, but they smelled sour and were soaked in black soot. Cinderella's stepsisters, on the other hand, were not sad servant girls. They had everything to wear. They had colorful costumes, handsome hats, and shiny, showy shoes. That's why they were going to the ball and Cinderella was sitting at home. Because everyone knows the ball is the perfect place for colorful costumes, handsome hats, and shiny, showy shoes. If only it was the perfect place for me, thought Cinderella. Yes, Cinderella had absolutely nothing to wear, but inside she had an awful lot. Inside of her, there was a great, glowing goodness, a courageous, caring kindness, and a soft, safe sweetness. Even the birds and mice agreed. Her fairy godmother knew that someone as sweet, kind, and good as Cinderella needed to go to the ball. So with a whirl of her wand, the sweet servant girl's holy handkerchief became a twinkling tiara. Her dingy dress, a gorgeous gown, and her smelly socks, a set of sparkling slippers. At the ball, Cinderella saw more colorful costumes, handsome hats, and showy shoes than she'd ever seen in her stepsister's closets and they had very big closets. Cinderella had never felt so happy in all her sad servant life. The prince was a bored boy who had absolutely nothing to do at his very boring ball until he saw a twinkling tiara, gorgeous gown, sparkling slippers, and a not-so-sad servant girl he knew it was time to dance. And they danced and talked and smiled and laughed song after song, after song, after song, after song. A prince might dance once with a girl wearing a gorgeous gown. He might dance twice with a girl in a twinkling tiara, or even three times with sparkling slippers. But when a girl has great, glowing goodness, courageous, caring kindness, and a soft, safe sweetness, a prince simply must dance, song after song after song. After song after song. The fairy godmother's magic soon faded, and Cinderella again had nothing to wear. But the prince did not care. He only cared for her. And of course, they lived happily ever after.
A boy like you. There are billions and billions and billions of people in the world. But you are the only you there is. And the world needs a boy like you. The world needs a boy to be kind and helpful, to be smart and strong. Maybe your strong is making sure everyone has a chance to play. Maybe your smart is knowing the precisely right, perfect pass to make. Oh boy, be you, the you that makes you feel most alive. Play hard, but play fair. Be a great teammate. Say nice goal and good try. Don't say you throw like a girl, ever. And remember, there's so much more than sports. There are vegetable gardens to grow and flowers to give. There are cakes to bake and eat too. There are instruments to play and songs to sing. There are stories to read and stories to write. There are science experiments to do and math problems to solve. Oh boy, be curious. Take a risk and raise your hand. Smart kids ask questions, so ask a lot of them. The more you know, the less you'll fear. Here's a secret that not many people know. Fear and bravery are partners. You can't be brave without first being afraid. If you're not ready to be brave, ask for help. This shows you're smart. Sometimes you may feel like crying. Cry. This shows you're strong. One day, you'll be a man, and men cry too. Oh boy, dream big. You are unique, and your dreams are yours to dream. It's okay to not know exactly what you want to be or what you will become, but whatever you become, become a good one. And remember this about dreams. You don't get what you wish for. You get what you work for. So work hard for what you want. In this world, you will meet all kinds of people and all of them are different. Ask people to tell you their stories. Then listen, listen hard. Stories connect all of us. They're part of what makes us who we are. Don't forget to tell your own story too. As you travel and come and go, hug your family and high five your friends. High five your family and hug your friends. Walk with your head up. You'll want to see where you're going. Smile at people and say hello. Leave every place you visit better than you found it. And leave every person better than you found them. 
Say please. Say thank you. Say I love you. And if that's not exactly right, simply say I like you. And maybe most importantly, say how may I help? <laughs> Helping each other is the best way to make our world stronger. Oh boy, be thoughtful. Eat lunch with the new kid. Hold the door for the person behind you. Do the right thing, even when no one is looking. And most of all, be you. You'll discover that the best you is the you that is all you. Not a little you and a little someone else. You are original, and that's a wonderful thing. And always remember, the world needs a boy, a smart boy, a brave boy, a kind boy. Oh boy, a boy like you. Little heroes, inventors who change the world. Kai Loon. Little Kai liked watching wasps make their delicate nests from strips of bamboo. In AD 105, Kai gathered tiny pieces of bark, old rags, and fishing nets. He mixed them together, pressed the mixture flat, and dipped it in water. When the sheet dried, presto, Kai had invented the first piece of paper. Johannes Gutenberg. Like a new star, it shall scatter the darkness of ignorance and cause a light heretofore unknown to shine amongst men. Little Johannes lived at a time when hardly anyone had books because it took too long to write out copies by hand. Around 1439, Johannes sent metal letters down in a block. Adding ink and paper, Johannes created the first printing press. He could print thousands of pages in no time. Ideas started spreading around the globe. Leonardo da Vinci. Learning never exhausts the mind. Little Leonardo was curious about everything. He watched, he measured, he wrote, he wondered. He drew plans for machines that became real hundreds of years later, like a submarine, bicycle, and helicopter. With his greatest tool, a paintbrush, Leonardo invented ways to paint that made him the most famous artist in the world. Thomas Edison. Our greatest weakness lies in giving up. The most certain way to succeed is always to try just one more time. Little Thomas was always reading and asking questions. 
One question was, why must I use dirty, smelly gas lamps to light my home at night? He began to tinker with light bulbs. In 1879, after hundreds of failed attempts, he finally found a way to keep one lit. Now people all over the world use electricity to see in the dark. Louis Pasteur. To know how to wonder and question is the first step toward discovery. Little Louis lived when no one really knew why people got sick. Using his microscope, he looked and looked and looked for the answer. Finally, Louis discovered something no one else could see. Germs! He found that if you boiled the germs, they went away. In 1885, Louis learned that germs could protect people too. Since then, Louis's vaccines have saved millions of lives. Marie Curie. Nothing in life is to be feared. It is only to be understood. Little Marie loved to study elements, materials that come from the earth. She tested a special rock until she found a strange glowing blue light. What could it be? Marie had discovered a brand new element, radium. Doctors soon found that radium could fight off deadly cancers. In 1903, Marie was the first woman to ever win a Nobel Prize. The Wright Brothers. Isn't it astonishing that all these secrets have been preserved for so many years just so we could discover them? Little Wilbur and Orville were brothers who liked to tinker with machines. One day, their father brought home a toy helicopter that flew. They wanted to fly too. They studied the wings, the tail, and everything they needed to know about flight. Crashing never discouraged them for long. Finally, in 1903, they flew the first airplane. Grace Murray Hopper. If you've got a good idea and you know it's going to work, go ahead and do it. Little Grace loved learning about math, science, and cool gadgets. Once, she took apart seven alarm clocks just to see how the gears worked. When she got older, Grace figured out how to program a room-sized computer to respond to human language, not just number codes. Now people all over the world can use computers every day. These heroes imagined and invented a better world. What kind of hero will you be?
sweet dreams, Sarah. Before the Civil War, Sarah obeyed her owner. Hurry up. Eyes down. Don't speak. Slaves were property, like a cow or a plow or the cotton that grew in the master's fields. But every day, Sarah dreamed of a different life. A husband, a family, a job that she loved. Her father was a carpenter. With a hammer in his hands, he could build anything. Sarah thought she could too. Then something happened that changed their lives forever. A new law freed people from slavery. Sarah moved to Chicago with freedom in her pocket, hope in her heart, and dreams swirling in her head. She made her first dream come true when she married a kind stair builder named Archibald Good. They started a family, her second dream. Sarah rented out rooms in their home to people who needed a place to live. She saved every penny she could to pay for her third dream, her own furniture store. Every day, Sarah worked alongside her husband. Measure, cut, sand. And every day, Sarah listened to her customers. Pretty crowded at our place. There are five of us crammed into one room. Sure wish the kids had their own bed. Many of Sarah's customers worked at low-paying jobs. And even those with big families could only afford to live in a one-room apartment. Sarah looked at the furniture in their store. Too boxy. Too bulky. Too big. Then Sarah had an idea, another dream. Maybe she could build a piece of furniture that would save space for her customers. If she could create a new kind of bed that folded up when it wasn't being used, each kid could have their own bed. Sarah hurried to the lumber yard, clutching her precious saved coins and when she returned home, she began building her invention. Measure, cut, sand. Finally, she hammered in the last nail. Standing back, she looked at her creation, a desk, but not just any desk. Inside the cabinet doors, a fold-out bed was hidden. Sarah pulled. She pushed. Ugh. Stuck. Sarah took it all apart and started over again. But everything went wrong. Wood split, nails bent, the bed wouldn't lay flat. Sarah didn't give up. 
She took a deep breath and dove right in to fix it again. At last, she stepped back and smiled. Now, when she pulled out the bed, it slid back in without a catch or a squeak. Archibald wanted to sell it in the store right away, but Sarah knew there was one more thing she had to do. She dreamt it. She built it. Now she needed to claim it. Sarah needed to get a patent. A patent is a piece of paper from the government that says no one else can make or sell your invention. If someone else got the patent first, Sarah would lose the right to make and sell her cabinet beds. Sarah met with a patent attorney and they filled out the application. She explained how her cabinet bed was a new and useful idea. Sarah slipped the documents into an envelope and mailed it. And the waiting began. Months passed. Had the application gotten lost in the mail? Had they found out she was a woman or that she was black? Sarah knew some people thought a woman should stay at home to cook and clean and take care of the children. She knew that others believed if you had dark skin, you didn't have a right to own anything, and certainly not a patent. But Sarah knew better. After a year, a letter finally arrived. Denied. There were already patents on similar inventions. Sarah needed to prove hers was different. Carefully, she changed a word here and a sentence there explaining more about her unique mechanism, the idea that had come to her so long ago. Slipping the paperwork and a bit of her heart into the envelope, Sarah sealed her fate and sent it off. Once again, she waited. This time, a thick envelope arrived from the U.S. government patent office. Sarah took a slow, deep breath. She slid out the papers. She read out loud, S.E. Good, Cabinet Bed, number 322177, patented July 14th, 1885. Staring at her name in print, Sarah proudly traced each letter. Her idea, her invention, her name in history. She had built more than a piece of furniture. She had built a life far away from slavery, a life where her sweet dreams could come true. Ladies who changed the world. Martha Washington. I have learned that the greater part of our misery or unhappiness is determined not by our circumstance, but by our disposition. Martha 
grew up working on a farm with six younger siblings. She learned that anything a boy could do, she could do too. During the Revolutionary War, Martha showed great courage. She came to winter camps, nursed sick soldiers, and brainstormed strategies. As the first First Lady, Martha welcomed to her home anyone who wanted to discuss the new country. Abigail Adams. Remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Abigail's parents taught her to visit the sick, feed the hungry, and bring clothes to the cold. When Abigail married John Adams, she didn't know that one day she would be Mrs. President. Grateful for her big heart and smart mind, John regularly asked Abigail for ideas. She wanted women to have rights in their new country and taught her children to fight against slavery. Dolly Madison. Habit and hope are the crutches which support us through the vicissitudes of life. Dolly helped her mother run a boarding house to earn money. That's where she met James, who later became her husband and the President of the United States. Dolly loved discussing the needs of the country. What do you think about this? She'd ask. What should we do about that? She invited leaders to her home often and held the first inaugural ball. In 1812, when the White House was on fire, Dolly made sure an important portrait of George Washington was safe. Eleanor Roosevelt. You must do the thing you think you cannot do. Eleanor was just nine years old when she became an orphan and went to live with her grandmother. It was a lonely childhood with lots of time to think, but she studied hard and learned about all kinds of ideas. Her time as First Lady, Eleanor fought for fair pay, equal rights, good living conditions, and better treatment for workers. Some people say she was the most important First Lady in history. Jacqueline Kennedy. to enlarge your child's world. Love of books is the best of all. Jackie always had a gift with language. Her essays and poems were published in newspapers, and she could speak English, French, Spanish, and Italian. While in the White House, Jackie helped her husband write inspiring speeches to rally the country. Her love of the arts brought opera, dance, Shakespeare, and even the Mona Lisa to the Capitol. The American people love Jackie's sense of style and elegance. Betty Ford. The Sir 
search for human freedom can never be complete without freedom for women. Betty often went with her mother to help children who couldn't walk on their own. She learned a lot about how people should be treated. When she became First Lady, Betty fought for equal pay for everyone. She created a place for people who struggled with addictions. She also opened up about her own struggles with cancer, letting the country know it was okay to have weaknesses. Lady Bird Johnson. Where flowers bloom, so does hope. Claudia's nanny once said she was as pretty as a ladybird. The nickname stuck. One of Ladybird's favorite things to do was paddle on the lake near her home. Ladybird's love of the outdoors only grew. As First Lady, she was committed to making the capital beautiful. She planted millions of flowers along the routes and made sure areas with natural beauty and wildlife were kept safe for everyone to enjoy. Laura and Barbara Bush. Never lose sight of the fact that the most important yardstick of your success will be how you treat other people. Barbara Bush. Barbara spent many evenings reading together with her family. Her love of books came with her all the way to the White House. As First Lady, Barbara wanted every child to know how to read. Barbara's son, George, later became president like his dad. George's wife, Laura, followed Barbara's lead when she became First Lady. As a second grade teacher and school librarian, Laura knew that teaching children could change the world. Hillary Clinton. It is past time for women to take their rightful place, side by side with men in the rooms where the fates of peoples, where their children's and grandchildren's fates are decided. Hillary once saw a group collecting money for the poor. She made a backyard carnival for neighborhood kids and donated all the dimes and nickels she earned. First Lady, Hillary argued for changes that would help women and children. She also became a state senator and secretary of state. In 2016, Hillary came closer than any woman in history to becoming president of the United States. Michelle Obama. still many causes we're sacrificing for. So much history yet to be made. Michelle did so well in school, she was able to skip a grade and graduate early. She loved learning and was accepted to one of the best universities in the world, Princeton. Michelle was a lawyer when her husband, Barack, became the first African-American president in U.S. history. 
As First Lady, she focused on raising her two daughters and helping our country get fit. She championed exercise and healthy eating and planted the first White House garden. These First Ladies made a difference in the world. What kind of hero will you be? Irving Berlin, the immigrant boy who made America sing. Irving stood on tiptoe to see over the rail. Behind him, too far to glimpse, was Russia, where angry Cossacks had burned his family's home to ashes. Ahead, was America. What would they find there? Suddenly, people pointed to a strange green figure in the distance. Was this the famous Statue of Liberty? The passengers whispered. Then a melody rose and flew to her like Noah's dove in search of safe land. Shema Yisroel, hear, O Israel. Irving's heart lifted and soared. His thin, high voice joined in, gathering strength with each note. The statue seemed to welcome them. God bless America, his mother said. God bless America, Irving whispered. He could hear the statue singing her own special song low and warm. One day, Irving promised himself, I'm going to write a song just for her. Life in America was strange. Instead of his small shtetl with dirt roads and wooden houses, Irving wove his way through crowded sidewalks. Big buildings blocked the light. Carriages rumbled down streets, and a crazy, thrilling metal contraption called an elevated train clanked and whooshed overhead. He still heard Yiddish and Russian, but now it was mixed with English, Italian, and German from all the different people who had come to America. Music was everywhere. Irving sang in the synagogue with his father, who had been a cantor in Russia, the one whose voice carried people's prayers to the heavens. Walking home, the melodies in his head mixed with the crack of stickball games, the wail of the ragmen, and the creak of cartwheels on the cobblestones. Back in his family's crowded apartment, there were more sounds. The steady treadle of the sewing machine in the apartment next door. The thump of his mother kneading dough. And soft laughter when his father pressed his cheek against her flowery face. <laughs> Irving lay awake, late at night, trying to fit all the notes and words together. When Irving was 13, his father died. Still a boy, Irving quit school to sell newspapers, earning pennies to help feed his family. Ashamed of being another mouth to feed, he scrounged scraps and slept in a dirty tenement with hundreds of other ragged homeless kids. Even there, he was always listening. Snatches of jazz, bits of lullabies, whispered jokes. One day, while he was selling papers, he couldn't stop the notes swirling in his head. He burst out singing. People stopped, smiled, and tossed him coins. 
Irving stared at the bits of copper glinting in the sun. People were paying him for music? Would they do it again? He tried singing popular songs on street corners. Irving didn't have the strongest voice, but his hummable melodies and catchy rhymes made people smile and stick around for more. People threw enough coins that a passing restaurant owner noticed and offered Irving a job as a singing waiter. A real job, making music. Irving wanted to write the melodies he heard in his head and felt in his heart, but he didn't know how. So every day after the restaurant emptied, he slowly tried to pick out tunes on the old piano. At first, he was terrible, but slowly he got better. People noticed. When a singer at another restaurant wrote a hit song, Irving's boss asked him to do the same thing. Irving still didn't know how to write down music, but the restaurant's pianist did. He helped Irving write Marie from Sunny Italy. They sold it for 37 cents. At 19, Irving was a paid songwriter. Word spread about the talented singing waiter. Irving was hired to write words for songs by the Ted Snyder Company. But he wanted to write the melodies too. He sang tunes to a pianist and paid him a few cents to write down the notes. Four years after his first sale, Irving wrote Alexander's Ragtime Band. The song was so catchy, so irresistible, it became an international hit. Years later, stars like Al Jolson, Louis Armstrong, and Judy Garland would perform it. People all the way in Irving's native Russia went wild dancing to it. Irving wasn't a waiter anymore. His songs made a lot more than pennies. Now he and his family were never hungry or worried about how to pay rent. But even after he moved to a fancy apartment, Irving would walk a few blocks to his old neighborhood in the Bowery, where he could listen to the rhythms of the street, the sounds that would fill his music. When the United States entered World War I, the Army put Irving to work, writing patriotic songs. He wrote an entire Broadway musical for the soldiers called Yip Yip Yap Hank. His mother watched proudly, wishing his father could hear the applause as Sergeant Berlin sang, Oh, how I hate to get up in the morning. Every night, the audience roared as Irving and the 300-person cast marched down the aisles and out the door, singing the final song, We're On Our Way to France. On closing night, the soldiers marched out the door and onto the troop carrier, which took most of them to France for real. Twenty years later, when the United States was getting ready to enter World War II, Irving wanted to help his country again. He picked up a song that he'd originally written for the World War I show finale, but never used. It ended with three notes from the Shema, as he remembered hearing them on the boat coming to America long ago when the statue had smiled at his prayer. He blended the melody with his mother's words, God bless America. At the end of the old melody, he added new words about the land he loved. Irving showed the song to his friend, Kate Smith, the famous singer. Would she understand what he was trying to say? Kate hummed the notes, read the words, and nodded. From the mountains, to the prairies, to the oceans white with foam, 
Americans all over the country huddled around their radios, listening to Kate Smith sing God Bless America. On the eve of the dark days of World War II, the song filled them with hope and courage. It still fills people with hope and courage. Over the years, Irving earned a lot of money from songs like Always, There's No Business Like Show Business, and White Christmas. But he never took a penny for God Bless America. Irving gave everything the song earned, millions of dollars, to children in the Girl and Boy Scouts. It was his thank you to the country that opened its arms to countless people from all over the world, including a homeless boy who came to America with nothing but music in his heart. America the Beautiful. Dream 
that sees beyond the years will celebrate when cities gleam hunting by human tears oh america america let's sing Together is much more than what pulls us apart Oh America, America Let's sing with open heart What stitches us together Is much more than what pulls us apart Books, what are you waiting for? It's a kid safe, ad free library full of storybooks brought to life. My favorite story on books is The Unicorn and Horse because the horse feels like he's, well, not beautiful, but he actually is. I'm going to explore more on books, and you should too. Don't wait around. Ask your grown up and start exploring more fun stories like these. You'll be glad you did. Thanks for watching. For more stories, try the Vux app for free today.